thank you very much, everybody, for joining us for this story swap on the theme of nature. Uh, Feast likes to switch between having our regular, almost monthly webinar sessions with this opportunity to give people a chance to share a so it's a good time. We're uh, very excited here at Feast because we are ramping up for the conference. Uh, and indeed, I think that was probably in my head when I first said, uh, was planning the, the batting order tonight and asked if Samia would kick us off because Samia is a member of the Bangalore Storytelling Society and is very actively involved in the planning of the conference. Good evening and happy to be here. I'm Samia, I love elephant stories and ones on brave girls too. So here goes. The story I have for you today is called Mouse's Share. The Adivasis, the tribals who live in Maharashtra, the Varli tribes believe that looking after nature and taking care of our environment is not a selfless deed, but one that will ensure the well-being of our very future. This story has been collected by Dr. Prabha Pradeep and I share it here with you. Yere yere pausa tula dete paisa paisa jala khota pausa la motha The land was flourishing. Rains were a plenty. Plants and trees grew, and so were humans there in many numbers. But humans were still hunter-gatherers. Until one day, woman turned to man and said, Aho, I am tired. I am tired of wandering here and there, and I want to settle down in one place. Man found this to be perfect. He decided to make a clearing near the forest and built themselves a little hut of bamboo and sticks. Woman turned to man again and said, Aho, I am tired of gathering food, hunting food. I want to grow food on our own. Man thought this was fine, but how to grow food? Woman then said, with seeds, of course. Where to get seeds? Aho! You know who provided us with everything? The gods. Go to the gods and ask them for some seeds. And she pushed man out of the door. Obedient man made his way to the skies. And there he met the great god in his mighty palace. He was mesmerized, but the voice of woman he could hear. Come back quickly. We need to sow the seeds before the monsoons, she had said. So he pleaded with the gods. You have provided everything. Please give us some seeds that we can sow, grow and eat. But God never grants anything so easily to man. He has to work hard for it, isn't it? So God said, I have no use for seeds in the skies. You need to go back and ask the creatures that surround you. Is it? Man was surprised, but then returned back on the next wind to the clearing where he lived. And there, looked for a creature that he could ask. He saw the great ancient one, the lizard, sleeping on the warm stones. Ajoba, grandfather lizard, Please tell me, how do I find seeds? Where do I find seeds that I can sow, grow and eat? I have none, said old grandfather lizard. I live on the food I eat from the crevices and cracks. Go ask another. Desperately, man looked for another creature and there a little crab was scuttling by. He followed it to its home. And once again, please, bow, brother crab, please tell me, where can I find seeds that I can sow, grow and eat? Little crab from its hole muttered, 
I have none. I live between the water and the land. But there is one, the boar who digs the sand, the earth. Go and ask him. The boar, why did I not think of it? And man made his way to the boar who was digging diligently. Great boar, my friend, please tell me, where can I find seeds that I can sow, grow and eat? I have no seeds. I can give you shoots. I can give you roots. But I can also tell you to go ask the great king of the forest, the Raja, the tiger. The tiger? To where am I going with this? Thought man. <laughs> Raja Vag, what, what, is, what will I do? But he made his way to the edge of the clearing and looked at the forest to see the flash of orange and black amongst the trees. Luckily, tiger had just eaten its fill and didn't want to harm man. And also, let me tell you, it was a time when man and animals were still in speaking terms. So they had a discussion. Man begged the king, please, Raja Vag, tell me, where do I find seeds that I can sow, grow and eat? Foolish fellow. Where are you looking for seeds amongst the creatures who have none? Go ask the squirrel, for do they not have? And hold the seeds? Go, go and ask. Of course, the squirrel, I didn't think of that, said man, and returned back to look at the foraging squirrels. I literally fell at their feet. Oh, squirrel, please give me some seeds. Now squirrels, again, had still not developed the fear of man. They were unafraid. So they boldly said, Oh, seeds, we have a plenty. What do you need? Sag, Sadat, or Shivam. Seeds we have to make trees. Oh no, I don't want to make trees. I need to grow crops. I need seeds that I can sow, grow and eat. But we have none, said the squirrels. Man had reached the end of his journey. He felt defeated. He was ready to give up when he heard a sound. The squeak of a mouse. He turned to see a kindest voice call out to him. Bao, brother, come here. I have seeds a plenty for you. What do you need? Millets? Rice? Barley? Lentils? Wheat? What do you need? Wheat! Please share some wheat! Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the man. And he brought his big basket, filled it with golden wheat seeds. And just as he carried it on his head, he turned to Mouse and said, Thank you. Thank you so much. I will share half my harvest with you. I promise. Majya Shapat, mother promise. And he went in. Inside, man and woman were delighted. They had already prepared the field. They sowed the seeds. They grew it and harvested it, cooked and ate all the food they needed. But what about mouse? It wondered, <laughs> what about my share? And when it ran towards woman to ask her for his share, she screeched, picked up a stick and chased it away. While man watched and not a word did he say. Mouse was furious. Is this the way you repay my kindness? For a promise freely made? I will have my share. From that day onwards, 
mouse you will find near the granaries dipping into the grains and sacks to take just his share. The Adivasis believe that one must always keep our word and Mother Nature has provided so much in plenty. So if we take, we must also learn to share. Thank you. Oh, lovely. Lovely. That's very nice. Thank you, Samia. And your voice seemed absolutely perfect for that. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry because uh, at the start, and I missed uh, sharing this. Is, can you tell us a little bit about the, this, the Wali as, as a, an art form? Is it uh, one particular area of India? Yes, 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 yes. I'm sure Usha will also be able to add some thoughts on this. It's from her land. She lives in Mumbai, but still, Maharashtra and Gujarat and the coastal and mountainous regions live these tribals. And um, they decorate their walls with this beautiful art form. Simple rice powder is used, mixed with water, which they draw uh, and use it on the walls. And I am fascinated by any kind of art form. <laughs> so um, uh, this was... Uh, I went the other way. I, when I was looking for nature stories, I connected with how um, the day-to-day -day life is depicted in these uh, paintings, on uh, uh, many of these paintings, their simple life. And from there, I was looking for a story and uh, got this story, which has been uh, collected by the dean, ex-dean of Tata Institute of uh, Social Sciences, Dr. Pradeep Prabhu. Mm. And uh, I got it online. Mm. and. Uh, really connected with how beautifully it tells us that um, no creature left behind. Every mm. key creature is required, needed for this world to uh, live yeah. and, and to, sure. for, for this world to be, um, to, uh, for the well-being of this world. So yeah. that's what uh, connected with me. And I, I love the way the, the poetic elements that you had in there was quite a lot of uh, rhyme, the sow and grow, and there was the shoots and roots and uh, the cracks and crevices. I mean, there was a very kind of musical element to your telling, which I really Thank enjoyed. You. Good one, good one. So we can go on now. And our second teller uh, today is Anna. Uh, and she's speaking to us from Oman, but you're not from Oman, are you, Anna? Uh, no, that's right. I'm from the UK, uh, but I live in Muscat in Oman. Right, okay. Uh, and how's that going? I, I suspect that most of us have not visited that part of the world. It's very hot at the moment, <laughs> so it feels like every day is a fight against the heat. And uh, yeah, please share with us your story. Okay, so um, good evening. For most of you, it's evening. Uh, thank you for letting me share today. I'm going to tell you a story that I learned from a Scottish storyteller, Pauline Cordina, and we used to do a lot of joint storytelling, and we <laughs> always used to heckle each other. So feel free to heckle at any time you want. In this <laughs> And it's a story that comes from the small towns and villages in England and Scotland. Those little places that are beginning to get abandoned, where the people are flooding out to go to the cities. But if you do still find a small village or town as it was in days gone by, you'll hear the people telling each other stories of the green man of the forest. And this man, or perhaps this creature, because no one can decide whether he's human or not, is seen in the edges of the forests and he's bedecked in leaves and he has foliage covering his, faces, his face. And the people say that if you see him and he's happy, that he will bless you, that he will make your crops grow and he will make your families flourish. But if you see him, and he is unhappy, he will cause your crops to wither and your family to decrease and break apart. But where does this story come from? To understand that, we have to go back and back and back in time, many, many moons ago, when the forest was still the king of the country. And one day, the gentle sounds of the forest the chirping of the birds and the rustling on the un of the undergrowth was interrupted by the clatter of, of hooves and the crashing of creatures through the forest 
two creatures. The first, an elusive white stag, and the second, behind, a knight in shining, shining armor, riding a horse. And the knight was young, and the knight was strong, and the knight was ambitious, and he knew what kudos he would get if he were able to catch that stag and bring it back and be victor of the hunt. So he rode fast and he rode hard and he chased this white stag through the forest unknown. But after hours of the hunt, the stag finally disappeared away from him and he could neither see it nor its trail anymore. And now his desire for catching the stag is replaced by a desire to cool down. His face is dripping with sweat and underneath his armor he is clammy and overheated and he sees something ahead of him that shines in the middle of the forest. And as he gets nearer, he sees that it's water. It's a lake. And now all he can think about is getting in that water, cooling down, having something to drink, getting out of his hot armor, recovering from the hunt. So he removes his helmet and his boots. He removes his breastplate, his tunic and his trousers until he is standing there as naked as the day he was born. And naked he ran into the lake and he jumped into that cool, refreshing water and he <laughs> drank it up and he swam under the water and he swam above the surface until after about an hour, he was refreshed and relaxed and cool. But then he began to think about getting back. The day was not, not going to last for much longer and he had a long way to go. He didn't know where he was exactly. So he turned round to where he had left his horse and his clothes. But when he turned, he couldn't see anything. They weren't there. Oh, I must have got myself turned about, he thought. So he looked around to the other shores of the lake, but he could not see his horse or his clothes anywhere. In a panic, he swam to the edge of the water. He got out onto the land and he started to run around the land, around the edge of the lake. But however fast he went and however hard he looked, he could not see his horse and he could not see his clothes. Eventually, it began to get dark. And as hot as he was earlier, he was cold now. And he realized he had to leave waiting for his horse and looking for his clothes till later. And he gathered up some leaves and he built a big pile of them and he snuggled into them for their warmth. And he stayed there all night. The next morning he got up, he set a marker in the ground and from that marker he head out into the forest and he looked for his clothes and he called his horse. And when neither came to him, he went back to the lake and he caught fish with his bare hands and he created a fire out of sticks. And he started to weave leaves together to make himself a cloak to cover him. And again, he slept in his leaves. The next day was much the same. He took a different direction. He headed out in it. By midday, he saw nothing. He returned back. And as the days turned into weeks, and the weeks turned into months, and the months turned into years, his life was very much the same. Wander out into the forest, look for the horse, look for the clothes, then return. He made clothes for himself out of the leaves, so he was fully covered, he was fully green. He caught himself fish, he collected nuts and berries, he made fire. But he also found when he went out into the forest, he saw signs of human habitation footprints in the mud or smoke in the distance. And he never saw any of the people that made those signs. But yet sometimes, if he went back to the same place again that he had been before, he would find little gifts of food left out for him. 
And of course, he was hungry, so he would take the food and he would take it back to the lake and he would eat it. And the next time he went that way, there would be bigger gifts, more impressive packages left for him. And so he lived for many, many years. And so he became known as the green man of the forest by all those people around who saw him but never spoke to him. And after many years, the gentle sounds of the forest, the chirping of the birds and the rustling of the undergrowth were disturbed by the clash and clatter of hooves and the green man out into the forest saw a white stag galloping past. And it reminded him of that first day and the memory sent him back to the lake and when he got near the shore, still hidden by the trees, he saw across the water a second young knight. And he saw the second knight removing his helmet and his breastplate and his clothes and jumping into the water. And without speaking to that knight, without stopping, he ran amongst the trees very silently. And whilst that second knight was swimming, he put on that knight's clothes, jumped on his horse and rode away back out of the forest. And of course now the second knight found himself trapped with nothing to do, nothing to eat, no clothes to wear. And over time he became the new green man of the forest until the whole thing happened again and again and again until this very day where there still is a green man in the forest. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. And I, ha I haven't heard that story before. That's just wonderful, wonderful. I didn't know, however, that there were still knights kind of riding into forests in this day and age. Uh, it would be I nice. think, I think it started thousands of years ago and maybe it's now migrated to cars or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But again, I just, um, for me, it was very vivid. I love the way you created the sense of the sounds, the, the undergrowth, uh, and the, the simple life of him um, catching his fish and weaving his uh, cape of the leaves. That was beautiful, beautiful. It's, like, it's a bit of a cheat for nature story because it's the other way around. It's like he's meant to be a nature figure, but mm. yeah, but anyway. Yeah. I'd be interested to know, I mean, again, when he came out there would be a good sequel there, you know, how that has changed him when he goes back to the court and now presumably a much older and wiser man, how that would change things too. Mm. Could we have like the, you know, the, the son of green man or something? This is a new story for you. <laughs> you want Fran, to make up to say something? So yes, Fran. Oh, well, I, I like the irony of the repeating, repeating cycle. And mm. I picture, uh, I'm and say a rabbit hunter going into the forest and having and becoming the next green man, the current yeah. green man. Mm. It could yeah. be, be contemporary, but you know, one wonders in these stories of a human turning into a figure that's been seen for hundreds of years, uh, do, don't they get old? Well, now we know they're just replaced by the next one. Mm. Yeah. Logical. Yeah, sure. I would imagine, is, is there a connection to like in, in Morris dancing, Anna? Is this that the green man is a figure that would, Morris men would use as well? I don't know. Uh, I know some Morris dancers, so I can ask them. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if it's a, an old tale or not, because um, uh, I've read some articles on Folklore Thursday that says that a lot of the green man stories are only about 100 years old. Oh, okay. um, so... I don't actually know if it's hmm. if it's old or if it's actually quite a recent one. It, it feels like it could be a much older story, yeah, mm. something um, dating way, way, way back. So thank you so much. And uh, again, uh, I, I love the way that you you worked with the, the camera and coming in close and and uh, and the way that you changed that the pace too, the, the the dashing of the stag through the forest. Lovely, lovely. Kriti, uh, making uh, your first uh, appearance here. Thank you very much. And you're going to share a story. But before you do, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Kriti. I've uh, ventured full time into storytelling two years back. Mm. Uh, 
have uh, begun exploring storytelling for children, storytelling for adults. And uh, what I work primarily on is I write stories to ensure mm. we can teach children uh, mathematical and science concepts. Uh, mm. That is one of the prime areas I like working on. And I work with teachers to ensure they use these stories to teach children in an easy fashion in the classrooms. So good. So do share, share your story with us. Great. And this is one such story that I've written by myself to share with my children, uh, primarily to teach uh, a little bit of geography, a little bit of how a river flows through. Uh, that is the intent behind the story. And I'll go ahead. Yeah. Hmm. It was just another day when the river, the grass, the trees, the birds and the sky, all of them began to play their favorite game. And what was their favorite game? It was not the cops and the police, not the seven stones, not the regular catches, and not the spin, spin and spin till you fall down. But it was the simplest of all games. They were playing color, color, what color are you? And do we all know this game? It's a beautiful game that allows us to share what color we are and what we think of ourselves in one word. Before we go ahead with the story, can we all quickly share what color we are? What color? Uh, are you uh, pretty? I'm going to look at you first of all because you're very bright this evening. Um, what I, color are you? I am yellow. <laughs> yellow. All right. Very good. And how about uh, you, Usha? What color would you say you are? Oh, I am the fiery red. <laughs> oh, very nice. Uh, uh, Kieran? Oh, cool purple. Cool <laughs> purple. Same thing. Uh, oh, okay, and Sam is showing you there. Uh, Lona, how about you? Fuchsia. Fuchsia, whoa. <laughs> Very good, okay. Uh, Mindy, what oh, color are you? I'm dark blue. Dark blue. Mm. Uh, Lynn? Gold. Gold, of course, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Anna? I'm blue. You're blue, yes. Uh, Sheila. Hey, I'm blue too, as is most of my wardrobe, as my friends will know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, even even the color, the cover of the last year's book had to be blue just to keep Sheila happy. There we go. Yep. Okay. Uh, and and for me, I'd probably go with a, a yellow too. Would be me. So is that everybody? I think we've got. To, oh no, it's Annette. Me. What's I'm your color? Bobby, uh, shiny silver. Shiny silver. Oh, thank you. And uh, Anamika, yes. Red. Red. Yes, 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 yes. Lovely. Okay, so back to Kriti. And turquoise. Oh, oh and I'm, to I'm share. sorry. And turquoise. Yeah. Oh. Vina? I'm sunshine yellow. Mmm, there we go. Great. And I am blue. Uh, I think I resonate with blue the most. I mean, that is my color. And uh, the sky, the blue sky, the white birds, the green trees and the green grass, all of them could share their colors quite easily until the turn of the river came. Color, color, what color are you river? And the river never liked this game because the river never knew what to say. There was a silence. What color was it? What color was the river? What color was water? Again, once again, the blue sky, the white birds, the green trees and the green grass all began to ask, what color are you river? What color are you water? Colors are so beautiful. What color are you? Water was now filled with a splurge of emotions and memories. She began to think of her childhood days, how colorful they were. The river began to share. Today, I'm a most settled, ripe and colorless person. But this was not how I was billions of years ago. I was bright, colorful and bustling with energy. My mother always told me that one should be helpful, giving and adjusting. She always appreciated me for being understanding. Ah, those were the beautiful days of delicate orange, cherry red and finest forest green. As I grew, I started helping people. Quenching thirst, household cores, factory help, I was working in the fields, I was working in the factories, houses, and I traveled across the world. How beautiful were those days? Golden yellow, lotus pink, saffron colored days. Ah, things were all going fine 
but there was an increasing restlessness within. Midlife crisis? Maybe. Where was I heading? Am I making the right choices? For all that I was giving, what was I getting back in return? These questions began to haunt me. But you know what I was getting back? Factory waste, pesticides, oil spills, plastic, dumping and disposal. I was angry. I did not want to give any more. Why should I give when I don't get back anything in return? My mother did tell me, this too shall pass. Just hold on. But I thought she wasn't right. She can't be right always. Those were the dark days of grey and brown. The anger and restlessness within me kept growing and kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. My mother warned me, but I could not control. And one day, my anger took over and I broke. My heart moved in a strange way and entered the lands like a charging bull. My tears invaded the lands, flooding the trees, the homes, the roads, the fields, the factories and the schools. Everything was submerged. Everything was flooded. There was a grey silence within, a sense of calmness within, a silent, steelish white. Things quite settled and I regained my senses, but it was all too late. What have I done? The fields were rotting, children were dying and the parents were crying. There was a melancholy inside, a faint, blackish, brownish, greyish, ash colour melancholy. I went back to my mother and I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried. She just said, this too shall pass. Taken as much as you can, but always smile back. Try to give a little more and reflect a little more every single day. There is a sense of peace and stillness and giving. This time, I thought my mother was right. And then on, despite giving, I believe a part of me died and continues dying in every single flood. A part of me still dies every time there is a flood. The colors in me melt every single flood. And I learn to give a little more and reflect a little more with each passing day. And you know what? Today, I can reflect all the colors I have and hence I stand colorless. Colorless by choice. The blue sky, the white birds, the green grass and the green trees, all of them were moist and began to sink. Color, color. Whatever color you are, you make the world a better place by just being you, water. Share your color with pride. And then on, water was very happy to share its color. That's it. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting idea to take me. The idea of a river uh, and to play it as a personality. What, what age do you normally or did you write that story for? This is for fifth graders so that I can teach the course of the Indian Ganges. I can also mm. teach uh, the, co the different colors and I, I can also teach how a river goes and joins the sea towards the ending. Mm. Okay. And okay. interestingly, I also use this story in appraisal conversations so that a person can chart himself on the path of the river and share at what stage of the course of the river they are. Uh, so usually freshers would put themselves in the beginning of the river bustling with energy, whereas slightly somebody frustrated with job would put them in the midlife crisis piece. And uh, then on we talk about their journey and their development. Are you going to do a, a sequel with um, uh, my life as a mountain or my life as a... <laughs> Well, that's you know, a very interesting a, idea, yeah. Yes, there's yes. a possibility there or a, you know, a very short-tempered volcano or something. Possibility for a younger group. Yeah, Good. very interesting. Thank you very much. My name is Usha Venkatraman. I am the founder, uh, member, and the creative director of Mumbai Storytellers Society, which I set up early this year. And we are working towards an international storytelling festival next January oh, in great. the beautiful misty hills of Panchgani, a few uh, hours away from Mumbai. I'm also putting together a science storytelling festival called Saifari, which is on the 12th of October. 
in Mumbai at the Nehru Science Center. And we have wonderful storytellers, stellar storytellers from across India joining mm. in. And it's a full day event. Uh, well, that's about me. And I've been meeting some wonderful storytellers in New York, Boston, Miami, as well as Toronto. Got to meet Dan Yashinsky. Mm. And uh, here I am about to share my story. Wonderful. So my story is a takeoff on Margaret B. Donald's story, uh, which is about Miku and the trees. And I shared this story when I visited Kashmir, Srinagar, at the Delhi Public School many years back. And um, so here it goes. Besides the dusky river which flows through the gentle forests of Kashmir, the river is River Lidder, which flows or snakes its way through the forests and villages of Kashmir, a small town in Pahalgaon stands an old majestic weeping willow or Kashmiri willow tree. And as the gentle wind blows, the weeping willow is whispering something to all of us, singing rather. I have a story I want to tell before I grow weary and old. So would you like to listen to that story? Well, when this story started, there lived a young boy called Abdul, who wasn't very old either, just about eight years old. And it was the end of the summer. Autumn was just beginning and it was getting cold. And Abdul's job was to gather firewood in the forest close to his village. So one day when he set out, he could have gathered the twigs and the branches that had fallen on the forest floor. But Abdul was lazy. He wanted to cut the first tree that he came to. He picked up his axe and the first tree that he saw, he decided it was a perfect tree for him to cut. And as he raised his axe, suddenly he heard a cry. Abdul, don't cut me. Don't cut me. And Abdul thought, Areva, is that a talking tree? Why should I not cut you? asked Abdul. Do you not see who I am? Abdul, I am the miswalk tree, also known as the Arak tree. I am a very old tree. You use me every day, Abdul, to brush your teeth. You use my twigs to brush your teeth. I take care of your dental hygiene. You don't want to cut me. I'm a very useful tree. And Abdul thought, yes, I brush my teeth with the Arak twigs. Yes, you are a very useful tree. Miss Walk tree, I won't cut you, said Abdul. No sooner had he uttered these words, the tree thanked Abdul and said, Remember, you care for us and we'll care for you. Abdul moved deeper in the forest surrounding the Lidder River and he came across the beautiful Chinar groves. Chinar translated as the maple trees that dot all over the Kashmir Valley. And he saw the beautiful yellow, amber, golden leaves of the Chinar tree. And he said, ah, a perfect tree for me to cut. And he raised his axe and the tree called out again, Abdul, stop, don't cut me. What, another talking tree? Why should I not cut you? Don't you see who I am? I'm the Chinar tree. I am the maple tree. You use my sap to make maple syrup. And I know you love it. If you cut me, Abdul, 
no more maple syrup for you. That's right, thought Abdul. Ami makes yummy maple syrup and I have it with my parathas every day in the morning, thought Abdul. Yes, Chinar tree, I won't cut you, said Abdul. No sooner had he uttered these words than the Chinar tree whispered, Thank you, Abdul. Remember, you care for us and we'll care for you. Abdul wandered deeply into the forest and he came to the banks of the river Lida and he came to this majestic weeping willow or the Kashmiri willow tree. And he thought, ah, perfect. And he raised his axe to cut chop down the tree when the weeping willow called out, Abdul, stop! Stop! Do you not know who I am? Yes. You are? I am the Kashmiri willow. Abdul, your favorite sportsman, uses my wood to make his cricket bat. Yes, Virat Kohli uses it. Even Sachin used my cricket bat made out of my wood. All the hockey players in India and maybe around the world use my wood to make their hockey sticks. I'm a very useful tree. You don't want to cut me, Abdul. Abdul sat down on the forest floor and he was astonished and he became thoughtful. That's right, weeping willow. You are a very useful tree and I love Virat Kohli. I won't cut you. And the weeping willow said, look around you, Abdul. Look at all the trees around you in this forest. The pine, the cedar or the devdar trees, the walnut trees. Look at them. And Abdul said, yes, the pine tree gives its cones to light my fire in the winter. The devdar or the cedar shelters the animals in the winter. And walnut tree gives me walnuts. Yes, every tree has something to give. I won't cut them. Let me gather all the twigs and the branches that are on the forest floor and let me collect them, gather them and take it home. No sooner had he uttered these words than the weeping willow, along with all the trees and the forests that were surrounding the dusky banks of the river Lida, as it snaked it way past all the villages, seemed to sway and move, and all the branches swayed, and everyone whispered, Thank you, Abdul. Remember, you care for us, and we'll care for you. And as the majestic weeping willow stands on the banks of the river Lida, I can still hear the trees moving and whispering amongst themselves and the weeping willow singing its song. Now that you've heard my story and if you care, why don't you share the story? Thank you. Mm. Wow, very nice, very nice. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I care for you, you care for me. That's very strong. Uh, and I love the, the, uh, the cricket references. Uh, it's been a wonderful uh, summer in, in, in England with the World Cup and with uh, Australia. So cricket has been very much uh, in my thoughts over the past uh, couple of months. I thought that was lovely how you brought that uh, into the story. Uh, and again, it seems that we have another story here with that personification. And if only, um, and perhaps that's why stories are so important, isn't it? Because we do give a voice to the animals or to, in this case, the trees, that they can actually speak to us. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah, very strong. Thank you. Thank you for Thank that. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Hi, Alona. Okay. Do not touch your camera. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, yes, you're about to tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, I think, before going into the story. Uh, yeah, aside from having technology gremlins, huh. 
Um, my big thing is that I recycle, repurpose, and reuse. Hmm. So I, I, I just uh, making the planet a little bit healthier mm -hmm. is very much within our realm. So I, that's my big thing. Um, I garden and I tat. And I don't know if you know what tatting is. Uh, no, tell us about tatting. Okay, tatting is actually making lace out of string. Hmm. Okay. It's not okay. crocheting. No. It's a series of knots. There. So I'm working on a piece while I listen to everyone. <laughs> so this is so your story tat? Um, yes. Yes, it is. So uh, this story is called That Kid. And I give it to all of those who have felt different and out mm. of place. And it's a personal story. I was that kid. When the teacher brought a brick to school and she held it high above her head and she asked, what can you do with a brick? my entire fifth grade class raised their hands and in unison proclaimed, build a house. And then I raised my hand and said, you can't build a house with just one brick. I'd stand on it, but then I'm only five foot two inches tall, so I'll stand on anything that will give me a little bit of a boost up. I was that kid caught in a world of my own and it seemed as if no one else was there with me. I grew up in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York and I would climb those mountains and I would open my arms and I would beckon the breeze and wish upon the wind, oh, that you would bring to me a friend and the wind never said anything that would be weird but it would come and swirl about me and wrap me up like a blanket coming around a small child for comfort my family would often hike those mountains together and there was one Sunday morning that my father came in the house and he said, okay, everybody get on your socks and shoes. We're going for a walk. That meant that we were going to go for a hike. I didn't want to go. You see, I really wanted to stay home. I was sad and I just wanted to be by myself. But being my 12-year-old self meant I didn't get much of a choice. So I got on my socks and shoes and we all headed for the hills. The canopy was so very tight because the trees grew so close together. When you looked up at the leaves, barely even a sun ray could get through, which made it all that more unusual when I looked down at the forest floor and there lay a pale blue party streamer. Huh. And attached to that was a dark blue deflated party balloon. And tied to that was a clear sandwich bag with a note tucked inside. Okay, so this walk was getting kind of interesting. I pulled out that note and I read it right there. Hi, my name is Renee. My entire class released these balloons we wanted to see how far the wind would carry them. I live in Ohio. 
please write back and tell me when and where you found this balloon. And it had her address and it was signed sincerely, Renee. Well, I folded it all back up, tucked it back inside of that sandwich bag and I put it inside my pocket. When I got back to my house, this was of course the days before computer mm. and calling on the telephone was extremely expensive. I pulled out a piece of stationery and I got my pen and I wrote back to Renee, dear Renee, hi, my name is Lona. And I told her when and where and how I had found that balloon. And I wrote her address on the envelope, put a stamp on it. And the next day, my father took it down to the post office to mail. Well, wouldn't you know, about three weeks later, I got another letter via the Postal Service. It was Renee. Dear Lona, wow, all the way from Ohio to upstate New York, the wind carried my balloon the farthest. Well, Renee and I, oh, but she also put on there, by the way, your name is very unusual. I like it. And she signed it sincerely, Renee. Well, Renee and I just started writing letters back and forth through the mail. I had found a friend. I was that kid caught in a world of my own and it seemed as if no one else was there with me. But now, the wind had brought to me a friend. That kid. That's beautiful. That is beautiful story, Lana. Thank you so much for sharing. And just take it completely different from the, the other stories that we've been hearing. Thank you. And it just reminds of what we have um, lost because we now do everything electronically, don't we? I mean, that excitement that you have, that joy of, um, of writing the letter and then getting something back, uh, which just, you know, email does not... Um, compare does it wonderful maybe you should you know you should see if you can get the post office to to sponsor you and they can make that into a little uh, ad or something to encourage people to start writing again just beautiful hey that's a thought <laughs> really yeah you know and and how long did that uh, um, uh, letter friendship continue oh my gosh it was several years mm. uh, I was I was like in like fifth grade Mm -hmm. and it went on for, oh my gosh, a lot of years. But yeah. just as a side note now, um, when I turned 14, I ended up getting a pen pal mm -hmm. from Greece, and he is actually coming to visit in about a week and a half. Wow. I've been writing to him since I was 14. Yeah. Wow. So you're, you're pen pals a are a good thing. Yeah, what a good correspondent you are. It's excellent. Well done. Uh, maybe you should forward it to the, your, your story to Kevin Costner and he could do a remake of his message in a bottle, you know, message on a balloon. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. or hope floats. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this case, uh, sinks. Uh, funnily yeah. enough, there's a, there's a story on the BBC at the moment um, that the helium is currently in, in short supply around the world. And so prices for, if you wanted to get a, a helium balloon for your birthday party, uh, it's now gonna cost you um, an exorbitant sum because it's just become such a, uh, yeah. A commodity. Commodity, yeah. So yeah, a good thing to invest in apparently at the moment is, is helium because the prices are going up and up and up and up. Uh, and okay. that is, um, right, and that's a pun right there. Yes. 
<laughs> okay, Fran, Fran, uh, you're waiting patiently there. Uh, good to have you back with us. Yeah, glad to How are you doing? I'm fine. The sun has come up. Oh, good. <laughs> It is now, yes, it's about 7.30 here in Oklahoma. Um, <clears throat> introduction. Uh, I've been telling stories since I was a little girl, I'm told. And um, big sister, five, five total kids. And um, I'm, I'm now on the board of the National Storytelling Network in the States. And as... Uh, Roger mentioned I'll be coming to the Feast Festival and then I'll be going on to Singapore and doing some of my stories that involve uh, especially environmental science because I'm a biologist by academic training but a storyteller by what I what I do most nowadays. When <clears throat> when I was growing up one of the stories that we kids enjoyed very much was the three billy goats gruff. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's originally from Norway, and it's a story that we enjoyed playing because we could take turns being the three billy goats and the troll, and uh, we used the low coffee table in the living room as our bridge. <laughs> and so we played the story very much and loved the story, but as I, as I studied biology and the environment, I realized that goats can be full. And I read, I, I realized, story. here the goats are the heroes of the story, but they destroy, kill their living one, and they are about to cross the river to destroy another hill. Uh, what's, what's with that? So <clears throat> this is my retold version of the story of the three billy goats graph. Hmm. As, as you know, if you're familiar with the story, there are big billy goat and a sized billy goat. And a little Goat and lived on there long enough that they had eaten all the leaves, all the twigs, the bark off of the trees, they had eaten the flowers and, and all of their leaves. They even ate the grass, which is not their first choice. They even ate the root. There was nothing left but rocks and dirt, nothing to eat. But Big Billy Goat Gruff looked across the river and said, Hey, look at that hill. It's all covered with green leafy stuff. Yum. Let's go there. Fortunately, there is a bridge across the river. But the medium-sized Billy Goat Gruff said, Bridge? Yes, yes, but I've heard there's a terrible troll under the bridge. I'm afraid. I don't want to go. And the littlest one said, No, no, troll. Big Billy Goat Gruff said, You must face your fears. A little as Billy Goat Gruff, why don't you go first? You'll see it's not so bad. The littlest Billy Goat Gruff went trip, trap, trip, trap over the bridge. And as he was going across, a voice from under the bridge said, Who goes there? And the littlest Billy Goat Gruff said, It's just me. I'm just the littlest Billy Goat Gruff. Good, then I will come up and eat you. Well, you know, the voice from under the bridge was actually coming from a park ranger, and she was vegetarian, so she would not have <laughs> eaten the goat, but she didn't want the goats to go across into her park and, and lay waste to it. Oh, oh, no, don't, don't eat me. I'm just a little Billy Goat Gruff. Why don't you wait until the, my medium-sized brother comes across? There's a lot more there to eat. The park ranger said, Oh, no, I don't want you coming at all. You get out of here. And the littlest Billy Goat Gruff was so scared, he ran back to his brothers. Well, there really is a troll. There really is a troll. I don't think so, said the biggest Billy Goat Gruff. And the medium-sized Billy Goat said, well, if you just heard a voice, maybe it's not so bad. You know, maybe some kind of an echo under the bridge. All right, I'll try. And the medium-sized Billy Goat Gruff went across the bridge, trip, trap, trip, trap. And the voice from under the bridge said, Who goes there? <laughs> I'm just a medium-sized Billy Goat Gruff. And the voice from under the bridge, the park ranger, came out and she put on her big park ranger hat and she was all dressed in green. And she said, You don't dare go across here. I will come up and eat you. And the medium-sized billy goat gruff said, ah, ah, really is a troll, big green troll, and went running back to his brothers. Well, really, really, big green troll. I saw it, I saw it. And the biggest billy goat gruff, feeling responsible as the eldest brother, I, I know how that feels, being a big sister, said, well, <clears throat> I guess I'll just have to show you there's really nothing to be afraid of. And so the biggest billy goat gruff went tromp, 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 
or Trump, 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 as it were, across the bridge. <laughs> and the, the park ranger came out again in her green uniform and her big green hat, carrying her air gun with its tranquilizer darts and said, who goes there? Oh, uh, I am the biggest, Bill Gruffin. I aim to get across and eat the green leaves on the other side. And the park ranger said, and I aim to stop you. And she fired her air gun and darted the big Billy Goat Gruff who passed out on the bridge. Well, the other Billy Goats came, Gruffs came running and she darted them too. And then she carried them all to her pickup truck and she took them into the park. You see, the, the park superintendent had been complaining about the brambles and poison ivy that were growing under the power lines that came into the park. He said, we'll, we'll just hire a helicopter to spray herbicide on all of those noxious The other rangers, they, they didn't want herbicide And fortunately, the stranger knew a better plan. They put in an electric fence Oh. They were put inside the fence under the power lines where they ate up all the bramble and poison ivy in that patch of fence. And then the rangers moved the fence along, kept all of the weeds under the power line, eaten and lived happy ever after. And that's a much more sustained version of the story. It certainly is. And uh, we were very lucky because you just began to, to hang a little bit. Uh, but fortunately, the power came through and we managed to get through to the end of the story. Thank you so much. I wasn't quite sure. Did they go, did they go Trump, Trump, Trump or Trump, Trump, Trump? I wasn't quite the sure. Went, Trump, Trump, Trump. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, definitely. So there's a, we could get climate change in there as well somewhere. Lovely, lovely. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm currently using the, the Zoom uh, platform to teach a course in uh -huh. environmental storytelling um, hmm. over, over the platform. I'm, I'm a little um, feeling guilty about flying way to Bangalore to be in the Feast Festival. Yeah. And so I want to learn how to use this so that I could teach without traveling. Exactly, exactly. Thank you very much. Really uh, a fun variation. And I'm glad the park ranger came out on top. Very good. Very good. I have a cousin who lives in um, uh, San Francisco uh, and they, the, the local community, they use goats to, um, to crop the grass there because they're on a, uh, you know, behind them, there's a canyon or something. So it's very uneven. Uh, and so the idea of, of using regular lawnmowers and stuff just wouldn't work. And so yes. the, they, they, they do have, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, community goats or something that are moved from field to field uh, or area to area. And, well, and here here oh, in oh, Oklahoma, oh. where we have poison ivy and other rather noxious weeds, mm. uh, there are goats for rent. Mm. You, can, you can rent them to have them come and take down the brush. Wow. Very good. Very good. So, okay, I think then if you wanted to share a little story, we'd be happy to hear it. Me? Yes. Okay. All right. I don't usually get to talk. No. <laughs> okay, let me it's start. only online that happens. I'm going to reassure everybody, you know, when we have our meetings, she does say a lot. <laughs> okay, this is slightly impromptu. I, I was the reserve, but um, this is a story that I learned from my very good friend and a storyteller I learned a lot from uh, called Jesse Go. And it's purportedly a Native American story, but I don't necessarily believe that. But it was found on the internet. <laughs> but it was a story that really attracted me. There was a time when the chief, the chief of the tribe was failing. He was old and his health was getting worse. His bones were aching. And there was something inside him that seemed wrong. And he knew that his time on this earth was not much longer. He would have to name a successor. But that was a problem, for he could not decide. There were three men who he thought were strong enough, brave enough, good enough to lead the tribe but he could not decide between them. 
And so after many days of worrying about this, he came up with a plan. He called the men to him and said, I want you to do a task for me. I want you to go out into the world for one moon. And in that time, I want you to bring me back the most precious thing that you can find. Whoever brings me the most precious thing, then they will become the chief when I'm gone. And so these three men went out eagerly, one to the east, one to the west, one to the north, and they traveled through many days. They saw many things. When one moon had passed, they returned, and they were led to the chief, one by one. The first man came and presented the chief with a beautiful flower. No one had seen something so beautiful and with a, such a sweet, fragrant scent. It is indeed a precious thing, said the chief. Thank you. The next man came in his hand a lump of solid gold and he gave it to the chief. Yes, that is indeed precious, thank you. The last man came empty-handed and he said to the chief, I have nothing to give you but what my eyes have seen. I traveled a long way until one morning, I crested a hill and I saw below a beautiful valley. There was a lake and when I went down to it, it was full of fish. There were flat plains, fertile plains around the lake. And I saw, I imagined our people fishing in that lake, growing crops on those fertile plains. And I walked down the length of the river into the forest and the forest was full of deer and rabbits for our men to hunt. When I saw that valley, that lake, that river, that plain, that forest, and I saw a future, a better future for our people there. The chief looked at him and said, that is indeed precious, the most precious thing of all. For you, given us a vision of our future, and you will be the next chief. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to keep it on the gallery view, I think. It's okay. 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 It's, 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 yeah. Mm. Yes, uh, the importance of um, uh, a vision story, a future story. Mm. Um, like how we need one in um, UK at the moment. One feels that uh, there's nobody who's actually got that kind of, you know, vision or clarity. Uh, and I think in perhaps many places of the world right now, um, you know, they're looking for a, a leader who could offer that kind of a direction, a place to go to. Uh, maybe that's why they, Mr. Trump was thinking of Greenland. Maybe that's what he thought was the vision. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it, isn't it? It's, it's through a story. When, when you describe it like that, Sheila, we can really see there's a, a place and this is somewhere we would like to, to go to for the reasons that are. It was very interesting. When I first started to tell this, I told it in the library, at one of the library story times. Mm. And there were a group of children there, and mostly preschoolers, some, some who were sort of seven or eight. And I asked them what, before I, uh, you know, before the men set off on their journey, what would, do you think mm. the most precious thing? 
And their answers were so wonderful. One, one, one little girl, I can still remember her, she said, my family. Another mm. tiny tot said, nature. Mm. Uh, there was one boy who said, you know, money. <laughs> yeah. And then later on, I asked him which one the chief would choose. And all of them said the last one, except this boy who had said money. And he said that the gold. But he also told me that his, his parents had already picked out the, the, the top school in Singapore for him to go. And they was planning to go to Harvard. And he wanted a house with the swimming pool. Mm. <laughs> so so he, five, he was... <laughs> I think it was his parents. <laughs> well, but at least he's got a, you know, he's written a story for himself, hasn't he? You know, <laughs> this, he's got his goal. He knows where he's going to go. Well, thank you. That was a, 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 a fabulous way to, to end. Um, uh, today, I actually just received something. It's my latest uh, prop. I have to work out how I'm going to put this into the story. Um, it's a carving. And I'm just looking here so you can see it. Uh, it's a kind of like a piece of bamboo. Thank you. Uh, and on the top, we've got a, a, a snail here uh, and a uh, cricket, Sasada, here. Uh, uh, and also underneath, which is quite perhaps interesting, uh, we've also got a, a, a little uh, gecko, perhaps. And uh, it's a spider, perhaps? Yes. So I have to see how I can put these four characters into. And it's made of wood. It's a beautiful carving. Um, I could see kind of like handing this around the audience as I'm telling the story. Uh, I got this on uh, eBay. So, uh, fun <laughs> thing. Uh, but I'm sorry, I didn't have the story uh, developed to share with you this evening. But we've had an embarrassment of riches uh, this evening. Uh, and um, if I was the chief and having to decide, uh, like the chief and she, the story, which of those stories to, to pick, uh, I would find that extremely difficult. And no, I'm not going to say which one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, otherwise I would have to become your correspondent because nobody else would be my friend forever after that. Um, great. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, give me a little while and I'll uh, edit this up uh, and it will be there available um, for you to look. I've seen a couple of people who didn't manage to... Uh, join us this evening who are looking forward to be able to to view it subsequently so thank you very much and we'll see you, you bye. soon bye bye, bye. bye. Thank, thank you, you. All our tellers. thank you thank you thank you, thank you.